Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to WaterWise Vegetable Gardening with Colorado Springs Utilities. My name is Katherine Moravec, and we're delighted to have you with us this evening. Um, my coworker Scott Winter is also on the webinar with me to provide support, especially for our our question and answer session. So, we're delighted to have you here. So let's jump right into it. So just to share a little bit about myself, um, I'm originally from the Denver area and I earned a BS in biology from CU Boulder and then an MS in horticulture from UC Davis. And I've worked in landscaping for the last 20 years and worked at Colorado Springs Utilities for the last 11 years um, as a water conservation specialist. And just wanted to say hello to everybody and say thanks again for joining us. We're really excited to have you here. Um, normally we would pro be providing this education face to face, but due to the current public health um, situation, we're going online. So we thank you once again for joining us. All right, so let's move on to what we're gonna be talking about tonight, which is vegetable gardening and how you can do that using water wisely. So here in the Pikes Peak region, um, growing vegetables is really, really rewarding and can be challenging. So we're gonna be talking first about the benefits of growing vegetables, and then we'll move on to the challenges and opportunities of growing vegetables in the Pikes Peak region. Because if you can just um, tackle a few of the more challenging things, then you can have a really good um, crop, a set of crops, and really enrich your life. We'll talk about some specific tips for success, and then we'll talk about what to plant and when, and then we'll talk about watering wisely. So let's go ahead and talk about the benefits of growing vegetables. So I love this picture. I took this picture when um, my friend Larry Stebbins and I uh, were teaching a junior master gardener class at Venatucci Farm. And these are some fourth grade boys who were pulling up carrots and eating them straight out of the ground. And it was just really fun to see these nine and 10 year old kids enjoying a vegetable straight out of the soil. Um, and so one of the major benefits of growing your own vegetables is better taste and freshness. I mean, there's nothing like taking a pea off of a vine and pop it in, popping it in your mouth and enjoying that wonderful sweetness that um, comes from a freshly harvested pea. And part of that is because of the delay with a lot of our produce from the time it's harvested to the time that we actually consume it. So for example, a head of lettuce on average is stored about one to four weeks from harvest to consumption. Carrots um, are typically stored one to nine months and apples could be as much as two to 12 months. And you know, this these new breakthrough, breakthroughs that have um, come out of all of the advances in post-harvest storage have really helped stabilize our food supply, which is a great thing, but they've also kind of helped us uh, move past this need to um, consume fresh fruits and vegetables right away. And so there is a huge benefit. If you grow your own food, you get to consume it right after it's harvested. Second, you know exactly how those fruits and vegetables were grown. You know if you um, applied any pesticides, you understand how those fruits and vegetables were stored after they were harvested, and you understand, um, you know, if, if you don't grow your own, then you don't necessarily understand the transportation that was involved in bringing that crop to you. Um, so there are a lot of benefits of knowing exactly how the food that you're putting in your body was treated before it got there. So this is actually a picture of a head of broccoli that I grew myself. And I, you know, just looking at it, it, it kind of warms my heart. I know it's a, it's a plate of broccoli, but um, it's so inspiring to be able to grow something from a tiny plant all the way up to its fruition that you get to enjoy. Um, and another one of the major benefits is that eating more vegetables leads to better health. Eating vegetables is one of the major factors um, 
in terms of reducing your risk of heart disease, reducing your risk of stroke, high blood pressure, um, certain forms of cancer, diabetes, gastrointestinal problem, gastro gastrointestinal problems, and vision problems as well. So the more vegetables you eat, the healthier you are likely to be. And we know for a fact that the people who eat, people who grow more vegetables are more likely to consume a lot more vegetables than people who don't grow their own. So now that we've kind of covered the uh, benefits of growing vegetables, let's move on to the growing challenges and opportunities of the Pikes Peak region. So here are the, here's a summary of the major challenges that we have. Um, and I would summarize them as really saying we have erratic weather events. If you come from a different part of the country, oftentimes you might have come from a milder climate where things are pretty predictable. You might have a very predictable spring that gradually comes out of winter and into the growing season where you get the opportunity to grow um, lots of wonderful spring crops. Here in Colorado, we have this flip-flop between winter and summer um, that we call spring, but I'm not really quite sure that that's exactly what it is. <laughs> um, so we also have periodic droughts, and that by that I mean really um, a lack of precipitation, particularly in the areas that we collect our water, that can affect our water supply. And then locally here where we live, um, we can have extended dry spells. So we might have a, um, a dry set of weather that's really affecting our water supply or a, our local conditions or both. And that's something that we just have to plan on because um, uh, dry spells occur periodically in the semi-arid west. In addition, we also have hail. There are times when you will have a beautiful garden growing and then all of a sudden you get a dramatic hailstorm that can really knock everything to the ground in just a matter of minutes. And we might, oftentimes you don't just um, experience one hailstorm, you might experience a series of hailstorms. So that's something if you're growing vegetables, you definitely want to plan for and put some preventative measures in place. We also have these very strong thunderstorms that bring a lot of moisture at one time. Now, precipitation from rain is a good thing, but having too much of it at one time can cause damage to your crops. So making sure that you have some measures in place to mitigate um, extreme thunderstorms is a good idea. Um, in addition, we sometimes have snowstorms at unexpected times of year and also high winds. So if I could say that the biggest challenge that we have um, in the Colorado Springs area, we could sum that up. It would really just be that we're kind of trucking along in these um, normal weather conditions and then we have something unexpected happen. And that might be hail, drought, thunderstorms or snowstorms, high winds, whatever. So if we can mitigate against these erratic weather events, we can actually be pretty successful in growing vegetables. Another thing that you want to take into account when you're growing vegetables is uh, our late and early frosts. So here in the Colorado Springs area, um, typically our last spring frost occurs around the first week in May. So if you were looking for the date where there's a 50% chance that we might have another frost, that's actually May 6th. Now the later you wait in May, the less likely it's going to be that we're going to have another spring frost. So once we hit May 18th, there's a 90% chance that there won't be another spring frost. There's a 10% chance that we will have one, but you know, the odds are that you're probably out of the woods. Um, that being said, we can grow a lot of cool season vegetables or vegetables that can tolerate colder weather, you know, really starting in late March to early April. So um, those particular crops can withstand the colder temperatures. But if you want to really time your planting for your summer crops like corn, beans, pumpkins, squash, those really you need to wait until mid-May or later to plant. And we'll talk about when you should plant certain crops um, towards the second half of the presentation. Now, in addition, uh, we also have our first fall frost, typically around the first week of October. 
Sometimes it happens in late September and some years we get lucky and it doesn't happen until late October. But if you kind of plan that we're probably going to have a frost event around that first week in October, then that's a really good mindset to have to make sure that we'll get our frost protection in place to extend our growing season. So with the um, last spring frost usually occurring in the first week in May and the first fall frost occurring in the first week in October, that gives us about 150 days of frost free weather that we can utilize to grow vegetables in our yard. And that's actually a, quite a good growing season. It's relatively short if you're from a warmer climate, but we can get a lot of um, produce produced in that period of time. Keep in mind that we do have relatively cool nights in the Colorado Springs region. So that we need to take that into account when we're doing our planning. Now, one of the opportunities that we have is we have very bright sunshine here in the Colorado Springs area. And this intense ultraviolet light leads to rapid photosynthesis. So what that means is the rate at which your crops develop or the rate at which they can photosynthesize and make their own food is really high because we have this intense sunshine. So that's a really good thing. If we can get the temperature right in our um, growing areas, then we could take advantage of that. It also means that if you have the ability to protect your crops from these erratic weather events or from these periodic frosts that we get, that we can take advantage of um, this bright sunshine that we get year round to produce things in our garden beds, but also in protected structures like greenhouses. So it's really a great advantage that we have here in Colorado Springs. In addition, we have a reliable water supply. Um, as you all know, water here in the semi-arid West is a limited resource. It's a precious resource, but the forerunners that came in and developed the Colorado area really worked on a lot of storage, uh, water storage and delivery projects. Um, those water storage and delivery projects were initially meant to support agriculture on the front range, to support the growing communities. But now we can take advantage of those really amazing water projects that have been developed to support our vegetable growing around our homes. Um, so this is something that we can really rely upon and um, take advantage of as long as we're good stewards of this precious water resource that we have. Now here in the Colorado Springs area, the water provider is of course Colorado Springs Utilities and we have a very extensive, well-planned and well-managed water system. And this whole system was built to support a good quality of life here in the Colorado Springs area. So um, it's certainly a good idea to take advantage of this water system and produce valuable benefits for you and your family and your friends and neighbors to enjoy. That's a really um, good thing that we can thank our forerunners for. At the same time, it's very important that we use the water that is delivered to our homes and businesses wisely uh, because um, we, because water is a limited resource, we want to make sure that we're putting it to the best use and reducing waste as much as possible. So that's why Colorado Springs Utilities provides these types of educational events to our customers and to the public to make sure that you all have the resources that you need to be able to use water wisely. So let's go ahead and move on to some tips for success. So, um, if you have the opportunity to visit any community garden where you have a wide variety of different individuals gardening those plots, it soon becomes apparent that there are there's some skill involved in growing vegetables in this area. Um, so you'll see, imagine that you go into a community garden and you might see a plot that is really well tended, very productive, everything looks really good and healthy, and then the next plot over, everything sort of looks like what you see in the picture, maybe a little wilty, maybe not very productive. So what is person A doing differently than person B? And here are the most common mistakes that I've seen with people who are just getting into vegetable gardening as a new endeavor or people who are coming from different climates. 
The biggest challenge or the most common mistake that people make is not watering frequently enough. So when you're watering your landscape plants, especially if you're choosing water wise plants, those plants can go for a while between waterings. Well, vegetables have been bred so that they're very productive, but um, they rely on the fact that we're providing all of the fertilizer and water that they need to be able to be productive. So you have to water your vegetables frequently so that they become more productive. If you if there's a significant break in the irrigation frequency, then you're going to see stunting and wilting and death. So make sure you water your vegetables frequently. Another thing that's very important is, is that you really need to provide your vegetables with fertilizer and nutrients. Now, if you take good care of your soil and build that soil up, that'll help, but you still need to provide um, your vegetables with, with fertilizer because those vegetables are growing so rapidly in such a short time. Now that can be a traditional type of fertilizer. It can be from organic sources. That's up to you, but just make sure that you're feeding your vegetables adequately so they will be able to produce what you're hoping they'll do. Um, another thing is leaving plants unprotected. Um, so I will talk about some protection strategies, but the more you can do to kind of protect them without having to build elaborate structures, the greater your, your yields will be. Um, another thing that you might want to consider um, is that sometimes it can be problematic if you grow the wrong type of vegetable or the wrong cultivar. So if you're from another part of the country where it was great growing conditions for celery, and then you, you uh, would like to produce that in Colorado, you're going to be disappointed because we have the exact opposite growing conditions that celery needs. Celery needs a very cool, moist, um, long growing season with those types of conditions. We don't have that. We have hot, dry, intense sunshine, hot weather, and that is really going to be problematic for something like celery. So make sure you're choosing the, the types of vegetables that are going to be successful here in the Pikes Peak region. And then once you've done that, make sure that you choose the cultivar or the type of that vegetable that is going to be successful here. So for example, um, if you wanted to plant pumpkins and you have the opportunity to choose a pumpkin that has a short maturation time, meaning that it'll go from germinating to producing pumpkins in say like 70 days, you're going to be much more successful with that cultivar than a pumpkin cultivar that requires 125 days to reach maturity. So when you're buying your seed or you're buying your transplants, choose the cultivars that have the shortest maturation time. Okay, so um, just going back to this picture here, I wanted to explain that one year, this is a picture of a vegetable plot that I managed in Fountain. I had the opportunity to um, cultivate a 5,000 square feet plot of vegetables, and it was a great learning experience. And you can see it was all in ground production with drip tape. Um, and I was successful in some things and not so successful in others. But uh, from that experience, what I have really learned is that anybody that um, is starting out doing vegetables, I would encourage you to use raised beds. Now raised beds don't have to actually be raised. What I mean by a raised bed is that you simply have an area that is defined by some sort of frame, um, typically made out of wood, that that's the area that you're going to grow your vegetables, where you're going to improve your soil, and where you're going to focus your watering. I find that that really helps um, be more productive and reduce the work involved compared to in-ground planting. Now, it doesn't mean that in-ground planting can't be successful. It's You certainly can, um, but if you're looking to make the best use of your water, your time, and building soil, I would certainly encourage you to explore using raised beds particularly because it makes it a lot easier to weed. 
Um, if you have in ground production, you spend a lot of time weeding the paths, mowing the paths, weeding in between the individual plants, which is really important because if you have weeds competing with your vegetables, you're not going to get as much production. So, um, but when you transition into raised beds, what happens is that the amount of space that you have to weed is dramatically reduced. So I find that this is a great thing to do. Now this is a, um, a picture of my backyard and you can see I've got a group of four raised beds in this corner of my backyard and against the fence there's a grapevine that I have on a trellis. Um, but what I want to point out here is that my raised beds are actually pretty much at ground level and I just used a simple wood frame placed it on the soil and improved the soil in that area and added drip irrigation. And um, I've been using these raised beds for years and I'm very happy with this setup. Now, if you have um, limitations in terms of being able to bend down, you can go ahead and raise them up to uh, maybe three feet, two to three feet high. So that can improve your accessibility, but there's nothing wrong with just having it at ground level. Now you can, if you want, now if you have a bigger budget, you can always um, use a fancier material and build a more complex wood frame, but it's not necessary. All you're really doing is defining that area. Um, and I will have to tell you that my kids, I've trained them well enough <laughs> that they never step in my raised beds. And I think that the, that ability to leave that soil uncompacted is really one of the benefits of having some type of frame around it. OK, so once you've built your wood frame and you've put it in place, um, it's perfectly fine to use the existing soil that you have in your landscape in your yard. Uh, typically, Colorado soils are specifically low in organic matter, um, so they're mostly minerals. If you come from the Midwest where you have well-developed soil that's dark and rich and very productive, we don't have that here. It doesn't mean that our soils are bad quality. It just means that we're our soils are lacking that organic matter to really um, hold water and be productive. So if you do choose to use your own existing soil, whether that's a sandy soil or a clay soil, um, the best thing you can do to improve that soil is to add some good quality compost. Now you might see some recommendations out there to add all sorts of things to your soil. Um, that's not necessarily an important thing to do as long as you have um, tilled up your soil or shoveled it up to relieve the compaction and added some good quality compost. You're very likely to be successful um, as long as you also uh, do some fertilization over the growing season. So there's really not a magic formula here. It's just your existing soil, tilling it up and adding compost. Just make sure that you're adding a good quality compost. Um, you can also use manure, but you want to use a well aged manure so that you don't um, get any um, E. coli issues there. Now, if you want to raise up your raised bed so that you have it at a higher height, you probably will need to bring in some fill soil. So what we recommend for uh, fill soil is to go to a landscape yard and purchase a good quality topsoil. They usually have um, a topsoil that is mixed with compost. If you can get that pre-mixed, that'll make your life a lot easier. Um, but I would avoid things like Trimix and, and those other types of products. Just get a good quality topsoil because you're going to be filling your raised beds once. Um, go ahead and purchase a good soil, even though it might be a little bit more expensive than something, something like a Trimix. OK, now um, if you are going to be doing your raised beds, um, this is a picture of our, our vegetable garden here at the Waterwise Demonstration Garden, and we have five raised beds. And um, you can see that we have irrigation in there, and we typically have crops, which we haven't gotten around to planting yet, but we will. Um, what that leaves you is a lot of path space. So this is part of the um, strategy that's going to help you reduce water and maintenance. So if you concentrate your growing area into the raised beds, then what you're doing is you're leaving the, some surrounding areas of the soil where you're not going to be irrigating. Um, 
and you're not going to be weeding. So what do you do in the pass area? Well, what I would say is you can choose from a, a variety of materials. One option is to use breeze, which is what's in this picture. It's a, a crushed gravel that has a variety of particle sizes. So once you have your ground cleared, you just put on the breeze and it'll um, compact over time and give you kind of a loose, um, very fine gravel surface. Now we do get weeds in the breeze, but it's very easy to um, just come through with a quick shovel or a weeding tool and weed those out. So it's a lot easier to weed in breeze than it is in bare soil. Another thing that you could do is um, use wood chips. That's another thing where you might, maybe you clear out the soil around your raised beds and you put a three to four inch layer of wood chips and that becomes your walking surface. Now that's a really good option because three to four inches of wood chips will suppress a lot of weeds. So if you want to um, reduce your weeding as much as possible, wood chips is going to be a better option than breeze. Now you will have to top dress those um, wood chips over time, but it's a lot easier to top dress your paths with wood chips than it is to spend your whole summer weeding your paths. So <laughs> you can just work that into your maintenance plan. Now, if you really wanted to, you could um, install some sort of low water ground cover in these paths. That would be an option. Um, you might have to just figure out what that would be. It might be buffalo grass um, or some other sort of ground cover, and then you need to figure out how, if and when you would be watering that. Um, so leaving it unirrigated and unplanted is the least water use intense um, area or option for those paths, but you can certainly do a ground cover if, if that's what you'd like to do. So even though we're going to be irrigating very intensely inside the beds, because we have unirrigated paths, that balances out the water use. OK, so we're going to be having a question break in about two slides. So if you have any questions about the material that we've covered or wondering what we're going to continue to cover, please go ahead and type those in now. OK, so another thing that I would certainly encourage you to explore is using low tunnels. So once you have these raised bed uh, frames um, and you've improved the soil, and you have installed some sort of drip irrigation, which we'll talk about in the future here, then you might want to consider putting in a couple of hoops for a low tunnel. All this does is it provides you with a very inexpensive, flexible structure where you can add hail or frost protection. Because those are probably the two most um, common types of extreme weather, we get, weather events that we get during the growing season, this is certainly worth considering. So the two ways that I think are the most successful to create some sort of um, structure that you can drape um, a frost blanket on uh, would be either using what's called a cattle guard or PVC. Now with the PVC, what you do is you just um, pound, pound in a few pieces of rebar inside the corners or inside the edge of your um, raised bed frame and then you can get a flexible stick of PVC, cut it to the length that is going to work best for you and just stick it on top of that rebar. And in this particular picture you can see that they did four um, hoops of PVC to create this um, low tunnel structure. Now there is also this material called cattle guard, which is a grid of um, really fencing that's relatively rigid. So um, those are certainly good to explore if you want something more permanent um, and you have the ability to work with that, cut it and get it in the right size. Um, that can certainly be a good option as well. Now the PVC and the rebar you can get at any home improvement store or hardware store. The cattle guards you probably need to go to a feed store to get those but um, they're worth checking out. Now um, once you get your uh, your hoops in place you want to consider purchasing some frost blankets. Frost blanket is simply a thin woven polyester material that comes in a variety of weights. 
Um, it can be either light and thin or it can be relatively heavy, but the benefit of these frost blankets is they keep in the warmth and the moisture. So if you want to use them early in the spring to get your cool season crops to germinate, they're really effective. Um, the picture, the, the main picture in the, the photograph there is a picture of one of my raised beds and I use that in the spring to get my lettuce and spinach to germinate um, and it works really well. It creates a really nice germination environment and you can see that in this picture I didn't actually use the, the hoops um, but you could use it with or without the hoops in the spring. Once your crops are big and they're already germinated towards the tail end of the growing season, you will want to use some sort of frame to keep it uh, from crushing your plants. Um, now, the other thing that's really nice about these frost blankets is that they can exclude insects. So if you have a particular crop that you want to grow, um, say for instance spinach that is really susceptible to getting that little fly that burrows and tunnels in the leaves, you can actually leave this frost blanket on your spinach crop all year and it will keep that fly from laying eggs on your spinach. So it's a great way to grow organic vegetables without having to use any type of pesticide. So certainly check out frost blankets. Um, you can get them from our local garden centers or you can also get them through mail order, but they're really worth investing in. You can reuse them um, and they work a lot better than plastic and old sheets. So if you're serious about your vegetable gardening, it's a really good thing to invest in. Okay, now um, this is our last slide before the question break, but I just wanted to talk to the folks that are interested in growing vegetables in containers. If you don't have the space or the time to really invest in uh, doing raised beds, then doing some containers can be a great way to get started in growing vegetables. If you're going to do this, just make sure that you use a good quality potting soil. Don't use soil from your yard or straight compost or anything like that. You need a material that's not going to compact inside the pot, but will give your plants the right amount of water and air. And potting soil is a great material to do that. Um, also, just keep in mind that potting soil is not um, soil so it doesn't contain any nutrients. So if you're going to grow in containers, it becomes even more uh, important to fertilize regularly. <clears throat> so you can either do that with a soluble fertilizer like a miracle Grow or a comparable product, or you can do that with fish emulsion. And those are the two most common ways to get complete nutrients to your plants in containers. And if you're growing in containers, one of the really nice things that's that's good about that approach is that you can move them if we get some dramatic sort of um, weather event. So if you have large containers that make it difficult to move, you might want to consider investing in saucers with wheels. Those are really good if you know that there's an impending hailstorm and you happen to be home. You can wheel your containers close to your house and make it less likely that they'll be damaged by hail. So um, growing in containers is, a, is a, certainly a great thing to do. If you're just getting started, I might even encourage you to start with herbs like your thyme, rosemary, um, oregano, uh, basil. Those all make great container plants and those go a long way to making your, your cooking more rich and enjoyable. So with that, we are going to move on to our question section. And so Scott, if you don't mind telling us what we have. OK, we definitely have a couple of questions here that um, that I'm sure you can answer. Uh, the first one is specific to uh, cantaloupes and watermelons and other melons. Is it better to start with seeds or plants? Yeah, that's a great question. OK, so with cantaloupes and watermelons, we are right on the edge of being able to grow those successfully. Um, we're just a little too cool. So I have tried both of those for years because for to me that's the gold standard of having that homegrown watermelon that you can enjoy. Um, so the way that I have been successful with those is um, planting extremely short growing requirement cultivars, meaning like they're 50 to 70 days. 
those are the ones where you have the best chance. And I start from seed because they seem to get knocked back if you buy a transplant and transplant it into your yard. But um, I will say just experiment and develop your own system because part of the joy of growing vegetables is um, trying a whole bunch of things and figuring out what works best for you and then you can share it with everybody else. Okay, great. I've got a couple of watering questions here. Uh, with our new WaterWise rules, is it better to water before 10 a.m. or after 6 p.m. for vegetables? Okay, that's a great question. Um, I think morning is going to be a little bit better, but we will definitely delve into that in the watering section. Great. So, so yeah, the next question, <laughs> the next question is about watering as well. Um, and you may hit, uh, hit on this, but um, the customer is asking, is uh, is watering every three days adequate for vegetables? And you can probably get into that uh, later, but um, more specifics about how frequent watering, um, when you mentioned that before, the frequency of watering, can you be more specific? Yes, okay, so let's answer that one right now. I don't think every three days is enough. I think you're going to see a reduction in quality and yield. Um, so if you have more clay soil and you've heavily mulched, you might be able to get away with every other day. But um, most vegetable gardeners in the Pikes Peak region water um, every day or every other day. If you have extremely sandy soil, you might even be watering a little bit in the morning and a little bit in the evening. So vegetable gardeners, vegetable gardens are a very high water use um, area, but they're providing a lot of benefit for us as well. So we kind of have to take this um, global approach of balancing high water use with lower water use in other parts of our property, but watering every three days is probably not going to be enough for you. OK, do you have time for any more? Or do you want to move forward? Um, maybe let's move forward and see if maybe we're going to answer them in the next two sections, and we will definitely spend the time to answer any questions that you all have at the end of the presentation. So does, does that work for you, Scott? That works for me. Thank okay, you. OK, so let's go ahead and move on here. OK, so this is kind of a, a nice segue into this exact slide here. Vegetables do require consistent moisture. Um, if you don't water them routinely, then what happens is they don't produce as many vegetables as you would wish that they would do, and the vegetables that you do get taste really funky. A lot of bitter taste is actually a result of inconsistent moisture in the plants. So the rule of thumb is that you really don't want to see your vegetables wilting. Once your vegetables have started to wilt, that means that their yield um, is going to be reduced and the flavor is going to start to develop off flavors. So that being said, watering once a day is a good um, a good place to start. Sandy soil, maybe water a little in the morning and a little in the evening. And then if you have a heavy clay soil, then maybe once every other day. Um, but keep in mind, because you're watering so frequently, you don't necessarily have to water as deeply as you would otherwise. So this is a very different watering strategy than say you would use for turf grass or your landscape plants. So if you have questions about that type of watering, I would certainly encourage you to attend the um, Smart Watering Practices webinar because Lance is gonna be providing some great information about that. So going on into the WaterWise rules, uh, City Council did pass these WaterWise rules that are now in effect, and here are the six rules. Um, run your sprinklers no more than three days per week. Those are uh, the days of your choosing. Uh, between May 1st and October 15th, run your sprinklers before 10 a.m. and after 6 p.m. If you're watering before May 1st or after October 15th, you can run your sprinklers whenever you'd like during the day. Don't let water pool or flow across the ground. Repair leaking sprinkler systems within 10 days. Um, always use a shutoff nozzle when washing vehicles and equipment with a hose. And only use water for cleaning outdoor surfaces like driveways and sidewalks to protect public health and safety. So try a broom or a blower first. Now, <clears throat> you might be wondering, how do these rules apply to vegetable gardens? And the answer to that is that 
If you are watering your vegetable garden with overhead sprinklers, and those by overhead sprinklers, I simply mean a type of sprinkler that is in ground, like what you see in the picture, pop-up sprays, or even a sprinkler on the end of your hose, then you need to make sure that you're you're um, watering no more than three days a week and before 10 and after six. So if you are using a watering method other than sprinklers, if you're using your hose with a watering wand or you're using a watering can or you're using drip irrigation, then these water wise rules do not apply. So what that means is that um, if you're using a hose with a watering wand on the end, as long as you've got a shut off in between the wand and the hose, you can water any time of day you like, and you can water more than three days per week. So the reason why that these rules only apply to overhead sprinklers is that these rules are meant to reduce water waste in our community, and the vast majority of irrigation occurs on lawns and landscapes with overhead sprinklers. Um, so vegetable gardening produces a lot of benefit and so uh, as a utility we are um, not interested in governing those smaller uses that produce a lot of benefit. So that being said with your drip irrigation as well you can um, run your drip irrigation any time of day and as many days per week as you like. So with landscape drip irrigation, you might really only be watering your, you might be running that drip irrigation one to two times per week. In your vegetable garden, you might be watering every day, but um, watering for less duration than you would your landscape plants. So what I do in my vegetable beds is I have drip irrigation throughout the beds, but I use, a hose and watering wand with a shutoff um, to germinate my seeds. Because the se when you plant seeds, you want to make sure that those seeds are kept consistently moist until they germinate. So that might mean five days to three weeks, depending on what type of crop you're growing. Um, so, <clears throat> and because a lot of those seeds are planted pretty shallowly, uh, I use this watering wand with a with a shutoff. Um, so when depending on how hot it is, I might be watering those seeded areas two to three times per day. Um, and that's perfectly fine under the water wise rules. Okay, now I would certainly recommend that you invest in using drip irrigation. If you think you're going to be vegetable gardening for a while, investing in drip irrigation is key. Because if you have drip irrigation, and especially if it's connected to an automatic timer, it makes growing vegetables so much easier, which will make growing vegetables a lot more fun. So it's certainly worth the investment and I'm gonna go through some key points to help you get started in that area. Also, because drip irrigation on a timer can be a lot more consistent and regular than um, some human beings watering, like myself, I can be fairly inconsistent, you'll end up with better quality vegetables with better taste. All right, so as I mentioned, here's um, a vegetable garden here at the demonstration garden that has a drip irrigation system in it. And I'll kind of walk you through what that looks like. But I would recommend if you go through the um, the trouble of building a drip irrigation system in your, in your raised beds, um, make sure that you do connect them to an automatic timer. Be, you don't have to do that, but it certainly is worthwhile. Um, and those automatic timers, are relatively inexpensive or it can just be part of your regular irrigation clock that controls your landscape irrigation. Okay, so one thing I've learned over the years is that if you're going to build drip irrigation and you have more than one vegetable bed, make sure you put some sort of shutoff valve um, associated with each raised bed. And let's just go back here to this picture. You can see that the water supply line is coming up right here. And in this particular way that we built it, we actually brought it under the way the raised bed frame. You don't have to do that. You can bring it over the top. And then the first thing we did was put the shutoff valve. And that's really important because if you've got five beds and maybe only three are in production, you can turn this off so that you're not wasting water and watering those two beds where nothing is growing. So it gives you a lot more flexibility and helps you be more water wise. 
this is how I have it in my yard. I've got um, drip irrigation that's on the surface. And so I just have the shutoff valves close to the supply line um, rather than in the vegetable bed. So um, this is a way that I, I kind of added the drip irrigation after I built the beds. If you add the drip irrigation before you build the beds and you could do it in a way where it's a lot more hidden. OK, so there are um, two main options that I would recommend for drip irrigation in a vegetable bed. The first one is Netafim TechLine. Netafim is the name of the manufacturer and TechLine is the name of the product. This particular type of drip tubing has very precise drip emitters that are manufactured inside the tubing. And when this is running, what you can see is that there, it's getting a wet spot um, every 12 inches. This Netafim tech line, you can buy it in different um, spacings of the emitters. In this particular case, we bought the 12 inch spacing, and that um, is what I would recommend for a vegetable bed. Now, this particular um, product has relatively stiff tubing. So when you're building it, you can't wind it around the bed. It's just too stiff for that. So you have to build a grid with elbows and T's. Um, but once you do that, you will have a drip irrigation system that will last you for many, many years. So if you want to really take the time to do a good quality um, drip irrigation system, this is certainly worth in looking into. And as a close up, um, these drip irrigation emitters that are inside the tubing, they precisely measure how much water is going to come out of each emitter. Um, so it's a very accurate way of watering. Now this can also be a great way if you've got um, fruits that you are growing, say for example, strawberries or raspberries or something like that where those plants are going to stay in that spot for many years. Using this Netafim tech line can be a great way to provide a relatively permanent irrigation to them. The tech line stays above ground and it gets pinned to the soil surface with these landscape pins. Um, and so that's how that works. Now, if that seems like that's pretty overwhelming to you, then an, the other option that I personally like a lot is this quarter inch um, drip tubing. So this is not quite as precise and not as well engineered as the Netafim tech line, but it's a lot more flexible tubing. So what happens is that you install, you have your supply line either in or outside of your bed, you do your shutoff, and then you have your half inch drip tubing right here, and then you connect to the half inch drip tubing this quarter inch um, tubing, and it has emitters that are spaced every six inches in it. And you can see that this is a particular emitter where the water is dripping down. So what I personally like about this is that um, if I want to change things, if I want to maybe um, water a certain area of the bed more intensely, I can just pull up the landscape staples um, or the pins and move this drip irrigation around very, very easily. You don't have to use um, all the elbows and T's to get it to fit in your bed. You can simply wind it around and pin it down. So this is a much more simple, um, easy to use product if you don't want to do a very um, elaborate setup. And this works really well. You can also use it in containers or other raised beds. This is the particular product that I use in my raised beds at home. Um, so it's very inexpensive and you can find it at virtually any place that sells irrigation parts. So you would be looking for quarter inch tubing with drip emitters inside. All right. And once again, that's what it looks like. All right, so when you do build your drip irrigation system, you will be connecting to a water source. Now that water source could be as simple as a spigot on the side of your house. So um, certainly don't rule that out, especially if you're not quite sure, you know, how long you're going to be in the house or you don't have an irrigation system already. This is a really good option for you can um, use raised beds with drip irrigation and you don't have to do a complex setup with a, a manifold of valves. So don't let not having an irrigation system stop you. Just figure out how to connect it to your spigot 
and I've done several drip irrigation uh, setups that way and it's worked really well. Also what you can do is if you're not sure if you want to connect it to your irrigation valves permanently, you can start with it connected to your spigot and then migrate it to a valve later if you so choose. Um, on the other hand, if you'd want a pretty permanent installation, you can just connect this drip irrigation to your raised beds to an irrigation valve like you would a landscape area of your yard and um, then you can just control it with your irrigation controller that in your garage or your basement. So either way is perfectly fine. Either way you go, between your water source and your raised beds, you want to make sure that you have a filter and a pressure regulator so that um, you're cleaning out any particles so that they're not plugging your drip irrigation and the um, the pressure regulator will make sure that uh, the pressure is reduced enough so it doesn't damage your system once you've built it. Here's an example of a way that you can connect your drip irrigation to a spigot off the side of your house. And um, this is a very streamlined setup where it, it, all these pieces right here in this black part, that contains the um, pressure regulator and the filter. So very simple, it's a one piece you can buy and then you just connect it to your tubing down here. Okay, and another tip in terms of watering, in certain areas of the country with our high rainfall, high moisture, it's very common to plant in hills. That's to create um, more drainage uh, for your vegetables. Here in Colorado, don't do that. Don't plant in hills, instead plant in dips. And you can either do that by creating low areas of your yard. Um, in this raised bed, I have a little dugout dip and I've got that quarter inch tubing surrounding that low area. And that's where I plant my larger plants like zucchinis and pumpkins. Um, or if you're gonna do say like lettuce or carrots, you can just dig a trench and plant in the bottom of that trench. And that will allow your seeds to have much more consistent moisture. Okay, now when you're mulching, you can certainly mulch um, to preserve the moisture in the upper few inches of the soil and it's a really good practice for your cool season vegetables. So it's a really good thing to help retain that moisture. But I would say um, make sure you're mulching your uh, cool season crops only. So things like cabbage, lettuce, spinach, carrots, um, all of that. Don't mulch your hot, your warm season plants like your tomatoes and pumpkins and um, let's see what else would be warm season, like tomatillos, because those particular crops de depend a lot on warm soil temperatures and mulch will cool down the soil. So <clears throat> it's a good idea for cool season, but not necessarily for warm. Um, and my favorite mulch for um, vegetable beds is straw. So I just go and buy a bale of straw at the feed store and then use that to mulch around. Okay, so we're gonna move on to what to plant and when, and this will be the last section of the webinar. So um, I talked a little bit about cool season versus warm season plants. Um, when you go and buy vegetable seeds or transplants, you wanna make sure that you're buying the right um, uh, species or, or types of vegetables at the right time of year. So just understanding the basics between cool season and warm season will really help you out. So cool season vegetables grow best between 40 and 70 degrees. So these are the types of plants that we're going to grow in the spring and then again in the fall. The warm season plants grow best between 70 and 95 degrees. So those are the plants that are going to grow the best during June, July and August. So this is a really nifty um, chart that comes from Colorado State University Extension and Scott will either post that in the Q&A box and or and or we will uh, send this link out with a recording of the webinar um, because this is a really great um, chart that shows what to plant when and this is specific to Colorado Springs. So Colorado State University Extension has these charts available for a lot of different areas in Colorado. This is the one for Colorado Springs and it'll tell you okay so starting in mid-April that's when you can plant your cool season crops like spinach, lettuce, kohlrabi, beets, broccoli, cabbage, carrots, cauliflower, chard, and peas. Um, and then early May is when you can start to plant the semi-tender plants like summer squash, um, cucumbers, etc., beans. 
And then after our last frost date, that's where you would want to put out your tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, basil, um, plant any watermelon seeds that you're going to experiment with. Um, so this is a really good planting guide. And what you'll notice is that if you have a particular raised bed that's going to be for cool season crops, you know, they're going to be done really when we start to get that hot weather in June and July. They're going to start to develop bitter flavors and they're going to start to produce flowers and seeds. But you can start replanting those crops in July and August. So you can get two crops of the cool season plants in Colorado Springs um, and at the same time also get a good set of crops for your warm seasons. But you probably cannot plant your second group of cool season crops in the same beds as you have your warm season. So you probably have to separate those two out. Okay, so now as you're planting, um, you may wonder if you should do direct seeding or transplanting. So direct seeding is where you're planting seeds directly in the soil, and transplanting is where you are planting plants that have already been germinated and grown like tomato plants or peppers. So the longer that it takes a plant to mature, the more likely you're going to want to do transplants. So I think transplants are great for peppers, tomatoes, eggplants. Um, those would be kind of the main ones, but you could experiment with others, um, even like cabbage, broccoli, kohlrabi, all those can do pretty well from transplants. If something is a root crop like carrots or beets or, um, oh my goodness, kind of going in the wrong direction here. Uh, let me back up a little bit. Then you would want to do those directly from seed because you can't transplant a carrot once it's already started to grow. So um, yeah, that's anything that would be direct seeded would be your root crops, plus other things that germinate really quickly. So for example, peas germinate really quickly, corn, beans, all of those germinate really pretty within a week or so if the soil temperature is right. And those are things that you can um, direct seed. All right, so let's move on now. Um, so I just wanted to share with you some of the crops that are the easiest to grow in the Colorado Springs area. And then I'll share with you um, things that people have had more challenges with. So if you're starting out vegetable gardening, here are some things that you can have really good success with. Now I know this might be a little bit of a joke, but zucchini is probably the best crop for the Colorado Springs area. And in fact, there's a joke, um, amongst people that grew up in Colorado that if you leave your car windows open in the summer, you're likely that you're gonna get zucchinis placed in there by your neighbors. So um, if you wanna just have good success, plant one or two zucchini plants. One or two plants is gonna be plenty for you and your neighbors for the whole summer. <laughs> You'll get a lot of fruits from that. And you can make a lot of really good stuff with zucchini. So um, give that a shot. Another thing that grows really well in the Pikes Peak region is garlic. So garlic is something where you uh, take the bulb and you separate it into the individual cloves and you plant that the first week in October and then it'll make it through the winter and um, mature in each, each clove will mature into another head of garlic in July. So for whatever reason, our climate is really adapted to grow wonderful garlic. So if you are looking for something to plant in the fall, don't forget about that. You will enjoy the amazing flavors of all of these um, wonderful types of rich and spicy garlic. Another thing that I would certainly recommend if you're a beginner is try bok choy. Uh, bok choy is an Asian green that has a white flavored stem and leafy green leaves and it grows really really well here and is a great addition to stir fries and other types of um, Asian dishes, salads and things like that. It's really great. And then we do really well with leafy greens. So mustard greens, turnip greens, collards, kale. Uh, we do really well with that. Now um, leafy greens are something that can be challenging to figure out how to cook correctly and I'm right with you there but they're certainly very very healthy and worth exploring. In fact um, there is a very large a uh, vegetable farm in northeastern Colorado. They have about 3,000 acres and they produce 
a lot of the leafy greens for um, the Denver market as well as Texas. So um, as long as you have adequate water, you can produce as many leafy greens as you can consume. All right, so let's move on to the next slide. Another, um, another, another three vegetables that we can do really well with here in Colorado Springs is kohlrabi. Kohlrabi is the one on the top right. It um, is a vegetable that grows this kind of swollen stem. It's a great fall crop. So if you plant this in August, you can be eating uh, kohlrabi gratin for many months to come. It's actually a really nice mild white vegetable that's really delicious. We also do really well with tomatillos. So if you love green salsa, um, you know, and you plant two or three tomatillo plants, you can be making lots of green salsa uh, for the rest of the year. And what a great thing to preserve and can for the winter season. Um, another great fall crop for Colorado Springs is turnips. Now, I know many of you may not be super excited about eating turnips, but there are some newer cultivars that are very mild, very thin skinned and delicious in terms of you can eat them raw or you can cook them. So don't overlook the humble turnip because we can produce a lot of those in the fall and they're relatively resistant to frost. So if you plant them in August or September, you can be harvesting them well into November and you can eat the greens and the roots as well. A few other crops that we do really well with, um, we do really well with hot peppers. So jalapenos, um, Anaheim peppers, um, hatch peppers, they all do really well as a summer crop. That's something that you probably want to do as a transplant rather than a direct seeded crop. Um, we don't do really well with sweet peppers because they have such a long growing season. But if you like spicy food, boy, you can really get some really nice hot peppers growing here. We do well with sunflowers as well that you can um, harvest for sunflower seeds. Um, or you can leave them for the birds and just enjoy the flowers, but we do really well with those. We can do really well with carrots as well. If you, the tricky thing with carrots is just getting them germinated and that requires consistent moisture. Um, but if you can get your carrot seeds germinated, we have a great climate for those and they will not be damaged by hail. So certainly encourage you to give those a try. We also do really well with onions. Um, so if you're choosing onions, make sure that you're not planting those from seeds or you just want to choose the little tiny germinated plants that you can buy from a local garden center and make sure you're choosing what's called a day neutral onion. Um, and so with those two parameters in mind, you can produce a lot of onions here in the Colorado Springs area. And then we do really well with potatoes as well. Um, so as you know, the San Luis Valley is a major potato producing area and they're just our neighbors over the, the hill there. Um, so once again, a great thing to try and now would be a great time to plant potatoes. And then corn, we, we do really well with sweet corn as well. And especially if you've got a large community garden plot, um, it's gonna be difficult to grow corn in your raised beds because it just needs to be planted in a big block since it's wind pollinated. But if you're doing a community garden plot, certainly plant a big plot of corn and you'll be enjoying it all summer. Um, a few other things that you might wanna consider um, in terms of things to add to your culinary endeavors, horseradish. Um, boy, we can do really well with horseradish. And in fact, this is a plant that Scott planted in our herb garden here at the demonstration garden. It's a beautiful ornamental and you can harvest the root to spice up your life. And then rhubarb, um, boy, we can grow a lot of rhubarb here. That's a very cold tolerant perennial um, that really is enjoyable and has beautiful wide leaves as well. A few things that we have a lot of challenges with. Um, so if you like a challenge, you can experiment with these, but if you're just starting out, I would probably avoid these until you um, get some systems under your belt. First thing is melons. Um, melons grow really well in the Arkansas Valley where it's a little bit warmer and hotter and there's a longer growing season. Um, and I would put watermelon in that category as well. But if you're going to try it, just make sure you choose the, the short day 
to maturity cultivars. Uh, basil, we can do pretty well with, except for the fact that basil is extremely frost sensitive. So a lot of um, long time vegetable growers will not put out their basil until June 1st um, and then uh, enjoy it while it lasts because as soon as we get um, a fall frost, it'll be the first thing in your garden to go down. Um, celery we don't do well with, as I explained earlier, and then blueberries. Blueberries is another crop where people will go to uh, dramatic lengths to get it to grow here, but it's just not suited to our climate. If you are somebody who really wants to grow something like blueberries, I would just encourage you to choose a substitute like Saskatoon berries or um, something else that is more adapted to the Colorado Springs climate. OK, so we have a, just a few more slides. It's a great time to type in any last questions you have. I wanted to close with a few tips for tomatoes because I, I don't know about you, but for me, tomatoes are really the highlight of the home garden. Um, <clears throat> after trying a lot of different uh, strategies for tomatoes, I would say the best, my top six tips are these. First of all, don't plant too early. Tomatoes, if the temperature drops below 40 to 50 degrees, they just will, they'll survive, but they'll just be stunted for a long period of time. So it's much better to wait and be patient and plant out your tomatoes in mid, the second to third week in May. Um, by then, once the temperature is really over 50 degrees permanently, then your, your tomatoes are really going to take off. So just be patient. If you want to plant earlier than that, make sure you provide some sort of frost protection, whether that's a wall of water or a, a hoop with a frost blanket, and then um, be sure to cover them up if it's going to drop below uh, 40 to 50 degrees. The major thing that affects um, tomato development is the soil temperature. So anything you can do to keep the soil warmer is going to make your tomato plants grow faster and develop fruit faster. So things that you are doing to slow down or cool down your, your soil, try to avoid those. So don't mulch them with straw. Um, and if you really wanted to speed up their development, you could look at a black or a clear type of ground cover. Um, and then if you can provide hail protection, if at all possible for your tomatoes, that might even just be a simple cattle guard over your tomato bed, then um, that really helps because sometimes it went in July and August when it gets, we're so close to getting tomatoes and then we get a major hailstorm and it's so disappointing. So um, it's really, really important. This is my daughter and this is a tomato harvest that we had um, in our, uh, off of our tomato plant, so it's really possible to get a lot of tomatoes. One thing I would say that is important to do is um, focus on the right cultivars. Make sure you're choosing the types of tomatoes that are quick to maturity. So anything 55, 70, 85 days is really good. If it's a tomato cultivar that's over 100 days to maturity, it's very unlikely you're going to get fruit or a lot of fruit. So if you're looking for just getting some some good quality tomatoes, I would also encourage you to choose a cherry tomato because cherry tomatoes mature much quicker than the bigger fruited tomatoes. And um, there are some really tasty cherry tomatoes out there like Sweet 100 and um, oh gosh, Sun Gold. Uh, so certainly check out the cherry tomatoes. I always plant three cherry tomato plants to make sure I get some tomatoes, um, even if my larger fruited cultivars don't produce. And then uh, the major disease that we have with uh, tomatoes in our area is late blight. Late blight is just a simple fungal disease that will attack your tomatoes um, in August and it causes all the leaves to turn yellow and then the whole plant will just turn brown and, and die. So the best thing you can do is choose cultivars that are resistant to late blight. And if you're looking at the plant tag, um, if it has a resistance to LB, late blight, then that's a really good sign that that particular cultivar will be successful here. So with that, um, Scott, if we have any questions, we could answer a few of those. Sure. Uh, first of all, I'll just say I should have eaten supper before your presentation because now I'm very hungry. Uh, the first question uh, is from Sheba. She is uh, wondering about cardboard farming. Um, she's heard a lot about that these days and wondering if that's a good thing to try. 
Hmm. Um, I've never tried cardboard farming, so I don't really have any experience to share. I would say that it's not something that I've seen used uh, widely in the Colorado Springs area. I've seen it used to try to shade out vegetation, um, either in a pathway or um, as a precursor to a landscape renovation. So I don't I don't know that I have anything to share there, except for the fact that I will say that in some wetter climates, cardboard will break down a lot more easily than it does here. It's got to be pretty consistently moist. So if you can figure it out a way to keep it wet or moist, then it might be worth a shot. Um, if you don't think that's likely, you might want to just explore how you could accomplish those same goals in a different fashion. Okay, great. Um, Judy noticed that the picture you had of the containers for container gardening did not have saucers. Is this something you would recommend? Um, well, so in my area where I've got my containers at home, I don't have saucers because I don't really care where the water is draining. So I've got some gravel areas and I just put my containers there and when I water, the water goes through out the drainage hole um, onto the gravel. So. Uh, but if you'd want to prevent damage to any type of surface where your containers are on, like on a wood deck or anything like that, the saucers could be really important. Um, so the drainage hole is critical. You have to have drainage in your containers. And when you water a pot with drainage, you're going to get water coming out of the bottom. So you just need to decide if the saucers are important for you, depending on your own situation. OK, great. Uh, Judy also mentioned that she plants her tomatoes on the south side of her house for the heat. Mm, um, is that a good, good recommendation? That kind of thing, whether uh, it's a retaining wall or uh, a shed or something like that, is that a, a good option? I think that's a great option. I love that idea. I mean, any place where you can get reflected heat to warm up a little microclimate, that's a fantastic idea. So yeah, great idea. Love that. OK, good. So the last Two questions I have are both related to protecting plants. Now you talked about um, a low tunnel before, but uh, the questions were specific to hail and mm. animals, so rabbits okay. or deer. Um, is a low tunnel uh, kind of the best option? Are there other options uh, for protecting uh, plants from both hail and uh, wildlife? OK, so with hail, um, you know, most of your garden plants can withstand a light little bit of hail, <laughs> but they, what they can't withstand is repeated big hail. So um, if you want to protect your plants from hail, one of the most effective ways to do that was is with some sort of mesh structure above the plants. And there's a lot of really creative ways to do that. Um, I think the cattle guard is a good idea, although the spacing between the wires and the cattle guard is probably three to four inches. Um, that will prevent mass destruction in your vegetable garden, but if you want to really um, create a better uh, type of mesh, then you would want something that has smaller holes like chicken wire or hardware cloth. And anything you can do to just build something that's more of a shield up above, um, that that's sort of what I would recommend for hail. Now, to be frank with you, I really only put hail guard above my tomato plants or the things that I feel like I really can't live without. Um, I don't hail guard everything in my garden because some things like potatoes and carrots, you know, turnips, if we lose them or, you know, the, the part you're going to eat is underground. So I don't really worry too much about those. Now, wildlife is a different story. Um, with rabbits, the fencing, I just use fencing and you just got to build up something that's high enough that they can't jump over. So anything that's a few um, feet tall is going to be sufficient or if your raised beds are high enough, then they just won't be able to get up and in. Um, so that's something where a low fence would work. With deer, boy, the really the only way that you're going to get um, get prevent deer from eating your vegetables is to have like a six foot fence around. So if there's anybody who has other experience or other um, ideas to share on that, typing them in the Q&A box would be really helpful. So that's why our vegetable garden here at the demonstration garden, we did put a six foot fence all the way around the garden so that we could exclude the deer. 
That's good. Judy was all over it. She actually uh, had the idea uh, if someone has access to dog hair or huh? even human hair, plant plugs, <clears throat> bunches, that sort of thing. Uh, would that work to deter rabbits? I don't have any experience with that. I I will. I I don't. I don't know. It might be worth a shot. OK. Uh, well, that is the last question we have, so. OK. Um, Great, so I think the last thing I just wanted to share was um, that we do have uh, two more webinars coming up. Let me make sure that I'm getting this over in the place where you can see it. Uh, we do have low maintenance landscape projects with Scott coming up next week. Certainly a uh, register for that one because Scott is an amazing landscape designer and um, he has some really creative ideas for you to consider. We do have um, on June 27th, a virtual tour of the demonstration garden. And on Thursday, July 16th, uh, Lance will present smart watering practices again. So right in the height of irrigation system, you can get some great advice from our irrigation specialist. And we have more at CSU.org. Um, so with that, I just wanted to thank everybody very much and wish you great success with your vegetable gardening this year. And please take advantage of all the resources that Colorado Springs Utilities has to offer. So we'll leave the Q&A box up for a few more minutes and wish you great success.